Okay, session 16, I'm just going to reference a phrase that we looked at last week. Because if you uh, look at the top of Psalm 142, it says the prayer when David was in the cave, of which is we understand is the cave of Adullam. And when David said in verse 3, one of the keys, he said, My spirit was overwhelmed within me. Then you knew my path. You knew the way in which I walk. That's the key phrase. That's what, that was one of the foundational truths that began David's recovery from depression in the cave of Adullam. We know from Psalm 52, which is written at the same time in David's life, that it was the mercy of the Lord. The goodness of God, His mercy that David claimed. But then he goes right from that to this, this, this understanding that God knew His path, that God knew the way that He was walking. Somewhere the understanding, the confidence that David had in the fact that God knew and understood and had a plan, a master plan, was the idea. What David was saying is, this does not surprise you, God, this is a part of a big picture. There's a master plan that you're orchestrating with delight and joy in my life. That's what he's saying. When he says, God, you know my path. You know the way in which I walk. He's talking about more than you just know the, the difficulty in the present tense. You know the big picture. You know where I'm going years from now. You know my inward uh, chemistry, my, my personality, uh, uh, emotional mix, my... My gift mix in terms of all the skills and abilities I have in relationship to people. Lord, You know my way. You have control and You have a big picture and I fit into it. And that helps me recover from my overwhelmed state of depression. Let's go to Psalm 138 on the way to 139. Because Psalm 138 and 139, many of the commentaries believe they go together, and they certainly look like they do when you study them. Psalm 138 and Psalm 139, I believe, go together in much the same way that Psalm 142 and 143 went together. And it's my theory, nobody can know this, but my theory is that David's writing this at this time of, of his life. He uses some of the very language that he uses in the other Psalms associated around the Adullam years. Some of the exact language is here communicated. But it's this issue of David connecting with the idea there was a big picture that God had understanding of. And David's confidence in God's understanding is what calmed his heart. He said, Lord, there's a big picture. It all adds up. It's going somewhere. Pain today matters tomorrow. There won't be too much pain or too little. It's carefully orchestrated. You're attending to it with such care. That's what he's saying here. And when, you, when that connects with our hearts, we really, we really relax on the inside and say, hey, something good is happening here. Psalm 38, 138, verse 1, I will praise you with all my heart. There's wholeheartedness. This is the wholeheartedness, the, the uh, psalm that we just looked at in the last session where David said, I will offer freely praise. It's that spirit of wholeheartedness. Look at verse 3. And the day I cried out, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. So we know that David's writing these psalms in a time when he's really uh, uh, under great duress. He's in a time where boldness in his soul is in question. And it's a time of trouble. And I place that at the very season that we're studying in his life right now, where God answers him when he wrestles in prayer, but boldness strengthens him instead of timidity and fear that I believe was really, and shame, which was really undermining David in the Adullam years until he struggled. It says in verse 5, Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, here's the idea, He regards the lowly, but the proud He knows from afar. He says, Though you're on high, you are regarding me in my lowly situation. And that's what Psalm 139 is all about. Verse 7, he says, you revived me. It's that same needing to be revived as Psalm 142 and 43. It's the same language as that psalm we looked at last week. And he says in verse 8, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Here it is. Here's the big picture. He says, there's a big picture. There's, and the Lord will complete it, is what it says in the margin. The Lord will finish the, the, the vast portrait that He's painting of my life. He will finish it. He won't leave it unfinished. 
And he goes right from this confidence that there is a big picture. There's a master plan that God's attending to with great care. He goes right into Psalm 139, which talks about God's knowledge of the intimate issues of David's life. And it was the knowledge of God's involvement, the knowledge of the big picture, again, that gave David, I believe, was some of his first steps of recovery out of the, the despair of Psalm 142, verse 3. God's going to perfect David's life. and He's going to perfect your life. It's, he's going to make sense out of today's struggle. It's going to make sense tomorrow. That's what David's con connected to. There's four sections of Psalm 139. And like I've said of several of the other psalms, this is considered uh, historically as one of the great psalms. You know, one of those top psalms studied through history. One of the grand psalms, Psalm 139. And undoubtedly most of you are familiar with it. We're just going to look at it briefly. Again, just kind of get you a little, uh, kind of a little bit aware of it so you go and study it. And again, studying it is really important, but until it gets into your prayer language, until it gets into your dialogue with God, these passages really won't help you. They're just interesting. It's like looking at a menu where you just hear the word preached. But if you, if you don't take it and eat it and digest it, if it doesn't get into your language, your dialogue with God, these things are just interesting menus at best. So that's my, that's my challenge to you. But there's four sections of Psalm 139. Verse 1 to 6, which is, some, I don't know, I was going to say the, my favorite, I don't know, I love it all. Just It's all great. Psalm 1 to 6, David talks about God's omniscience, 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 all-knowing, omniscience. God knows everything. That's what omniscience means. The omni meaning all, and science means knowledge, all knowledge, omniscience. Verse 1 to 6, David is magnifying God's omniscience. Verse 12, 7 to 12, his omnipresence, it's the same word omni, all, all presence, his omnipresence. He's everywhere. That's what uh, verse 7 to 12 is about, the omnipresence of God. Verse 13 to 18, his omnipotence, his omni, his all power, all power, omni, omnipotence. That's verses 13 to 18. And then verse 19 to 24, he turns it into prayer. And it's a pretty tough prayer. But what David's really saying is, I mean, David really goes after God destroying the wicked through the book of Psalms. But really what he's saying is destroy everything that destroys righteousness. That's what he's saying at the end of the day. In time and eternity, remove everything that hinders your righteous purpose. That's the strength of David's heart. It's not personal vengeance. It's David's zeal that the righteousness of God would be unhindered and every hindrance would be removed. God, in this uh, last part, David wants God to defeat all the enemies of God. Every, everything that stands in enmity with God to be removed. All the enemies within him, sin, and all the enemies outside of him, the wicked, whether people or demons. He wants all the enemies of God within and without to be destroyed. And he's praying that the enemies within him, sin, would be dealt with. He wants everything that opposes the will of God to be removed. Okay, let's look at verse 1 to 6. We'll probably put, we'll put more time in 1 to 6 than the other ones. It's David's revelation of God's om, uh, uh, omniscience. David's revelation of God's omniscience. He says, O oh Lord, You have searched me and You have known me. What, what a phrase. Now, now it's, it's interesting language because God doesn't actually search anything because to search something implies that God lacks knowledge that He has to exert energy to attain. And so He's using human language. He's really saying, in, in essence, You have known the absolute innermost parts of my being. To say you have searched me and have known me means that you have thoroughly acquainted yourself with every single thing that deals with me as a person. You know me intimately. You have full knowledge of who I am. Now, there's never anything that God has to search out to know. That's only 
just human language, poetically describing the activity of God. Never, there's never a moment in time or eternity that God needs to search out or discover. He already knows it. There's not a subject, there's not a person that he's not 100% acquainted with. And he's acquainted with it with such, in such an effortless way. This is really a source of strength in David's life. The ease in which God knows everything perfectly well to the very essence of its being. He says in Psalm 17, verse 3, the same idea. You've examined me. You've uncovered, the, I, mean, I mean, you have knowledge of the secret corners of my being. And to know that you are known to that degree and cherished is a very powerful reality. To know that you are that known and yet cherished is a very powerful reality. See, the unbeliever is afraid that God knows everything. They don't like the idea of God's omniscience. If God knows everything, they're in trouble. They're imagining that they're getting away with things. But to the believer that understands the doctrine of grace, God's omniscience is the greatest source of delight. The fact that He knows, we go, oh no, He knows. God says, I know the cry of your heart. I know the longing in your heart to be mine. Oh, I always thought all He knew was the bad stuff. He goes, no, I see every longing, every motion of your heart to me, I see it. Matter of fact, God rewards us and He even defines us based on the movements of our heart to Him, not just on our attainments. He has such thorough knowledge. So for a believer, because we have redemption, our, our, our failures, because we come with a whole heart of repentance. We don't want to walk in our failures. The Lord forgives us. But our longings, He rewards and esteems and defines us according to our longings. So the, the omniscience of God is a very powerful reality. That He knows us thoroughly and He cherishes us. That's a, an emotional dimension of God's omniscience. That we, we feel cherished and God knows every broken part of us and likes us. Wow! The war is over. He knows it all and He likes us. But it's more than just the fact He knows us and likes us. He knows everything and there's a big picture that we're a part of. And He knows every way how to get us to fulfill the big picture. There's no obstacle that can keep us from being perfected from the big picture. That's a very, very comforting thought. He starts off the psalm in verse 1 with, Oh Lord, He starts it off with adoration. Oh Lord, because He's coming right off of Psalm 138. Oh, verse 6, Psalm 138, Lord, you're on high. You have regard for the lowly. Verse 7, you're going to revive me. You're going to perf uh, perfect me. Verse 8, oh, Lord, he's breaking forth in adoration. And I love it. He says, you have. You could just say the four words, oh, Lord, you have. Insight from God about God is what thrills our hearts. Oh, God, you have. Put dot, dot, dot. And you could fill in the blank with any of the attributes of God. David's adoration, the essence of worship, is when God gives you insight about God that comes from God. Oh, Lord, I love you. I love you. You have. And he begins to describe the omniscience of God. But adoration is based on the revelation of God's name on his attributes. And this is just one attribute. It's the beauty of God's mind, his omniscience. But that's really the essence of worship. When we tell God what he tells us about himself, and it fills our heart with adoration and awe and wonder. He says this, I like, uh, again in verse 1, he says, Lord, you've searched me, you've known me. He makes it personal. Throughout Psalm 139, it's all personal. It's not just doctrine about how things are. It's all really personal. And I challenge you to put your name, wherever David says, I and me, put your name in there. This is an intensely personal psalm. Because when you know that God knows everything about you and likes you, and you know that God knows everything about the obstacles in the present and the future and promises that you're going to win, that something goes off inside really powerful. You go like, hey, it's not so bad anyway. After all, is it? And this is what uh, began David's recovery in the, in the Adullam years. He goes on now, he begins to map out the or, or uh, outline the arenas of life. He says, for instance, you know my sitting down and my rising up. He knows when I sit down to rest, you know when I rise up to act. You know when I'm resting, and you know when I'm acting. You know when I sit, and you know when I rise. You know my outward life, is what he's saying. Both dimensions of my outward life. The resting and the activity part of my, out, my outer life. 
But it goes beyond that. God doesn't just know when you sit and when you rise. He also knows your thoughts from far off. What a powerful sentence. And it's very personal. It's not you understand the thoughts of people. That's, he says, you know my thoughts, God, from far off. This is his inner life. He doesn't just know your outer life when you arise and when you, you rest, when you act and when you cease acting. He knows your thoughts from afar off. And this is a very powerful reality that the motions of your heart, the motions of your mind, before the thought is ever formed, when it's in seed form, he knows what it will come when it's, as it's germinating, he knows what it will be when it's fully thought through. You know, you're talking, you're saying, uh, well, let me think, uh, it's right there. The Lord says, oh, I already know what you're going to say, not just in the next four or five minutes, what you're going to say in the next billion years. When the thought is still far off, when it's barely germinating in your soul, I know the, the establishing of the thought. I know the development of it. I know the outcome of that thought on your life and everybody's life around you. David says, God, this is staggering. He goes, I feel safe. And you like me and you know my thoughts and you... Promise that I'm going to enter into the fullness of your plan, that you really will perfect my life? He says, yes. Isn't that something? God never in, uh, misinterprets anything. He, know, he understands your thoughts while we're grappling with them, while we're forming them, while we don't even know three and four levels of the complexity of the motive, and well, maybe this, maybe that, or this, uh, this situation will change it. He knows all of it. All the complexity of every thought you've thought. He fully interprets it well, and David felt that. Before they even took shape, he knew it. In other words, he's saying in verse 2, my actions and my thoughts, my outer life, my inner life, he says, from morning to night, every single insignificant thing, from acting to thinking, you already know it. Verse 3 is going to stay on the same concept. You comprehend. You comprehend my path and my lying down. There we have the path again. That's the activities. The lying down is again is the resting. It's the same thought as verse 2, arising and sitting. He says, you know the path. You know when I rest and you know when I act. The passive and the active dimensions of my life. When I'm running and when I'm sleeping. When I'm acting and when I'm waiting in passivity for things to be done on my behalf. You know everything happening in me. He says, you comprehend it. It's interesting, in the margin it says, in the New King James here, it says that you winnow it. And that's what the Hebrew word is. When they would thresh the wheat and they would winnow it, what they would do, they would go to a, a, a piece of a, a, a land that had a little bit of height to it, an elevated, uh, you know, on a hill, and they would take the wheat and they would beat it. They would thresh it. They would beat it so it would be separated, the good part from the bad part. And then they would take the wheat and they would throw it up in the air, just gently. And the wind, whenever the breeze would come, because it'd be on a mountain, I mean on a hilltop, and the, and the wind, because the wheat was actually heavier, and the chaff is lighter, the wind would blow the chaff away and the wheat would land back down there. And then you'd have a nice, good stack of wheat. And then you'd bundle it all together, have sheaves. And so to winnow the wheat means to throw it up and it sifts it. It sifts the wheat from the tares, the, the chaff, the fake stuff from the good stuff. It blows it away and he says... You sift through my, my path and my resting, my running and my sleeping. You sift through and know what's good and what's bad. You, you know what's lasting and what's not lasting, what's, what's reality and what's just fantasy. You can sift through it all. You winnow. You comprehend thoroughly when I run, that's my path, and when I rest or sleep, that's my lying down. He says in a general way at the end of verse 3, you comprehend everything. All my ways, body, soul, and spirit, mind, emotion, will, you know me thoroughly, God. You know me thoroughly. You say, well, of course he does. Well, it's one thing to know that kind of on a true and false test. It's another thing for it to touch your soul. Because what David says at the end of verse 14, he goes, these things my soul knows very well. He says, I've been brought into a living understanding of this intimate knowledge you have. That means you like me. Because you see the motions of my heart towards you and you've forgiven me for my error and you are going to perfect that which concerns me. He says in verse 14, I know these things very well. What a powerful reality. 
We always talk about David's thoughts and his acts. Now in verse 4, he's going to talk about his words. Thoughts, words, and deeds. Verse 2, 3, and 4. He's going to talk Talk about his words now. He's talking about his thoughts and his deeds. Now he's going to talk about words. There's not a word on my there's not a word on my tongue. But behold, O God, you know it altogether. It's the same thing. Before the words are fully formed, God knows them. He knows the motive of the words. Look at the phrase, you know it altogether. He knows the reason it's spoken. He knows if it will bear fruit. He knows if it's a lie. He knows if it's well intended but misunderstood. He knows if it's well spoken, but I mean misspoken, but still well intended. You know, you walk away and say, they didn't understand me. I didn't say it right. The Lord says, I understood you. The Lord says, I understand deeper than you understand. I like you. Isn't it something that somebody knows your words altogether? Every level of your words. The truth of them, the wisdom of them, the motive and intention of them. He knows when you get in a jam and you blow it and later you cry out to God, He truly believes you. He knows when you've repented. I like that phrase altogether. But here it is. Here's the beginning. Here's that phrase that we just looked at. Behold, O oh God. Behold, O oh God. There it is. It's like the last session. David breaks out and he goes, Behold, O oh God. Suddenly, the revelation of God is before him. It's the same language. He's wrestling with the Lord in Psalm 138 in prayer. And on Psalm 139, the breakthrough comes, just like in the last session, so like we looked at in Psalm 54, verse 4. When David wrestled in prayer and he said, Behold God, here it is again, Behold God. It's what Isaiah said in Isaiah 40, that the forerunner is supposed to proclaim, Behold your God. It's bringing people into interaction, living understanding of God. And when the knowledge of God awakens in the soul, everything begins to look different. Then he goes on in verse 5. He says, you have hedged me behind and before. There's the hedging. The margin says, you've surrounded me. David's aware he's surrounded by the presence of God everywhere. God's knowledge and God's presence surrounds him. God's presence is behind him in his past. And it's before him in his future. When David, when the un, when the ungodly or the unbeliever looks back, all of their sins are recorded, and God is behind them, recording everything they've done. They'll give an account. But when the believer looks back, they're all forgiven and they're erased, and only the motions of your heart towards God are remembered. Now that is an incredible reality. He says, "When I look back, behold, you, you're behind me, but you're also in front of me." You're behind me forgiving me and rewarding me. Forgiving me for error, rewarding me for good. You're in front of me providing and guiding. He says, it's mysterious how you do this, but when I look back, you always guided and provided me when my heart was towards you. As surely as God has guided you years ago, He is guiding you right now for the future. He's in front of you. He's, he steps ahead of you. Guiding and, provi and providing, setting things into motion that will come around and touch your life for good. There are things being set into motion in people's thoughts, words, and deeds that they're not even aware of that will come back and serve the purpose of God in your life. God has this fantastic tapestry of events He orchestrates worldwide. There are people that don't know you and you don't know them, but what they're doing now will end up serving the purpose of God in your life in a week, a month, and a year from now. And they don't even have any way of knowing it. The Lord orchestrates it all. There's no accidents. You can't escape the Lord. Some people want to turn back and just go backwards. Well, the Lord's there. The Lord will confront us there and discipline to recover us. Some people want to get ahead of the Lord. Well, you can't outrun Him or outsmart Him. He's ahead of you. He's already standing in the path. He's behind us and He's in front of us. We can't escape Him. We can't outrun Him. We can't get away from Him. The unbeliever will meet him in judgment and the believer will meet him in discipline and reward. Any way we go, he's there to train us and to bring us into goodness. Just, David says, I just give up. I, I just want to do it your way. Is it a distant presence? No. It says here, you hedge me behind him before, but you lay your hand on me. It's, a, it's an intimate presence. There's an embrace. 
He says, your hand is embracing me. It doesn't have the word embrace, but it's upholding with affection as well as, as, a, as a restraining us with discipline. The hand of God is that which, which uh, releases affection and that which releases is restraint and discipline. God says, I'm, David says, I know you're in front of me. I know you're behind me. You're preparing the way. You're providing and guiding. You're rewarding and forgiving. And in the midst of this, your hand is touching me right now. You're stopping me from things I don't even know why you're stopping me. And you're loving me in ways I don't know how I could ever deserve the love. I feel love and I feel restrained. I feel your hand is upon me right now. What a powerful reality. I mean, these are massive subjects. Again, verse 14, David says, I know these, my soul knows these things very well. He breaks out, and again, in verse 6, in worship. Oh, such knowledge. He goes, it's too wonderful. He goes, my God. He goes, this is an amazing thing. This is an amazing thing. I remember the, the time when it dawned on me how wonderful this was. I, I, I This is a strange story, but... I remember I was 16 years old, and I only met the Lord for about three weeks. I came back, and I was just on fire for the Lord, straight from Fellowship of Christian Athletes camp. I'm coming back. I'm telling all my high school buddies, it's the summer. We're practicing for football, you know. I said, it's real. This stuff's real. Go, yeah. I go, no, no, really, it's real. I go, God's invisible, but He does things you ask Him. They go, no. I go, yes, He does. We're driving. We're walking down the street. We're hitchhiking to practice. No, it's after practice. The guy goes, okay, I'm thirsty. I'm dying of thirst. You get, can I get something to drink? I go, yes. You want something to drink? He goes, yeah. I go, Lord Jesus, give us something to drink. And this is the absolute truth. A guy pulls over. We're hitchhiking. He says, I'm sorry, I can't stop. But he hands us something to drink cold right out, out the window. And he drives away. And this guy looked at me. And I said, in my heart, I go, Lord, the implications of this is massive. This is massive. I mean, this is, I never forgot that. The guy pulls over, hands us to where we are here drinking this cold drink. And my friend looked at me, I go, yeah, that's how it works. I go, like, we're friends. He knows me. Hello, I love you. He loves me too. I can feel it. This guy goes, this is incredible. I go, it is. That was only the beginning, but that was really real. Such knowledge is too wonderful. David says that I stand and I sit. I think unformed thoughts. I begin unfinished sentences. You're in front of me. You're behind me. There's a big picture. You're restraining me. You're loving me. You're rewarding me for giving me. You're providing for me. You're guiding me. You're showing affection and restraint. Everything's in order. You know everything about me, but you like me. He goes, this is awesome. This is a wonderful way to live, is what he said in verse 6. It's too wonderful. And yet so many of God's people, they won't put their cold hearts in front of the fire of His Word for the Spirit of Revelation to touch them. Beloved, it is wonderful. It's high. He says, I can't attain it. He says, I can only get on the edges of this. David looks up at the stars, as we know in Psalm 1, Psalm 19 and Psalm 29. He does with the stars and the thunderstorm. Psalm 19 and Psalm 29, we looked at it already. He does with the creation above him. Psalm 139, he does with his own life and his internal mechanisms of his soul. He goes, you know my inward workings and my, my personal life plan as clearly as you know the stars and the orchestration of the universe. He goes, how could they, you could know all of this? He goes, and you have as intense knowledge at every one of these levels. The Lord says, you're right. David says, this is too high for me. He goes, this is beyond my abilities. You're not only the God that knows my frame, my body. You're not only the God that knows my emotional makeup. You're not only the God that knows my personal history and where I'm going to walk in this age and in the age to come. You're the God that orchestrates the stars and the moon and the nations and all of history. He says, this is too high. This is, David, is, his circuits are being blown. He's worshiping. It's wonderful. It's He's fascinated. He's marveling at God by the spirit of revelation right here. He's, his heart is filled with awe. It's this awe that helps us say no to sin. It's this, it's this knowledge that gives us courage where we can face fear. 
It's this delight that helps us overcome grief. Some of you this very night are in a, in, a, in a time of grief tonight. This will thrill you. It's too wonderful. It's more wonderful than anything. It causes a buoyancy in your spirit. God says, I can, I can meet the need. I can sort out things in a way that's according to your frame that will surprise you. David says, this is wonderful. I believe he's writing this in the Adullam days. I truly believe it. Because again, 1 Psalm, 40, Psalm 143 Verse 3, and he says, it's the fact that you know this is what's helping me spin out of this despair. You know all these things about me. Now, here's, here's the issue in verse 6. It's so wonderful, I can't attain to it. If, this, if God's knowledge is so awesome, what is, and God's knowledge is only one of His attributes, one of many, many attributes, what is the sum total of all of His attributes on full, full on? His power, His love, His justice, His mercy, His knowledge... Every attribute fully on full throttle, if you will, in full combination. He says, your knowledge overwhelms me when everything is on on, which it always is. He says, God, I worship you. Who am I? He says in Psalm 8. And we plan to look at Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is, is a companion psalm to this where David is marveling at just the majesty of, the human, of a human being before God and the eternal plan. This is, he's talking about the majesty of the intricate makeup of the individual. Psalm 8 is talking about the human being as he stands before God's eternal plan, the high place of dignity he has. Oh, David has this spirit of revelation on him. Psalm 19, oh Lord, your glory in the heavens. Psalm 29, oh God, your glory in the thunderstorm. Psalm 139, the glory of your intimate knowledge of me as an individual. Psalm 8, the glory of human beings in the eternal plan. He was just, David lived and fed on this knowledge that God gave him. Verse 7 to 12, now he's transitioning from the omniscience, God all-knowing, to omnipresent, that God is everywhere. God is everywhere. These attributes obviously all overlap and they go together. Now this is another source of encouragement. That God doesn't know, just know everything. He is present in power everywhere too. It's not just that He has knowledge. He's actually there present in manifest power. When he wants to be. He goes, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Not that David wants to. This is a poetic adoration. He goes, Lord, how can I get outside of the grasp of your manifest love? He goes, Saul can't do it. Nobody can do it. It's a statement of adoration he's giving. He's not trying to sort out a way to get out of God's uh, grasp. He goes, if I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell... If I go to the region of glory, there you are. If I go to the region of darkness, there you are. He says it doesn't matter where I go, your manifest presence is there. And God's presence in hell is in the sense that not His sweet presence, but His enforced rule, His government is being administrated in judgment. The presence of His leadership is being exerted everywhere in the universe. Whether you rise to act or rest, you lie in your bed to sleep, whether in heaven or in hell, whether in light or in darkness, whether before you or behind you in time, whether thought, word, or deed, His presence is there completely encompassing you. Oh, I love it. He says, you are there. He says in verse 8, behold. There it is again, verse 4. Behold, O Lord. Verse 8, behold you. There it is, it's that breaking in that we looked at in Psalm 50, 54, verse 4. Behold God, my helper, behold God. There it is again. There's this fresh breaking in of the revelation of God on his soul as he's praising God. He goes, oh God, when he says behold God, he's not, don't just say, yeah, and behold God. He's going, oh my God, it hit me again. A fresh unveiling of God's presence to him. I believe he's in the Adullam years right here and God is causing his soul to be restored from the the despair and the depression. It says in verse 9, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. Behold, your hand shall hold me. The wings of the morning is just a phrase that uh, some say it poetically speaks of even the speed and the distance of the morning breeze. Others say it's the morning light that he's referring to. It doesn't matter if it's the morning, it's the breeze of the morning or the light of the morning. The wings of the morning that speed at which 
God's uh, light or, or whether it's light or wind, it's the idea that speed and distance have no, no bearing on God. He can, the wings of the morning, He's everywhere. The wings of the morning, whether it's light, it's razor shooting forth 186,000 miles per second or the wind is blowing, God's already there. Or in the uttermost parts of the sea. The uttermost parts of the sea. Now, you know, David's living... On the, you know, near the Mediterranean Sea. He's looking right there over it. And, the, and back in, you know, a thousand years BC, the ships were quite crude and, and, uh, so they were not reliable. So the unexplored regions, the unexplored regions of the frightening sea, that's what he's talking about. The unknown distant places. God's already there. He's not beyond knowledge. Now the, there is no uttermost parts of the sea in our thinking because all the sea, all the parts of the world have been explored. He's talking about the unknown regions of the frightening sea and their crude ships. That was a massive statement. He goes, there's no place beyond God's knowledge. He says in verse 10, he says, even if I'm in that completely unknown area, and that speaks of your life, God's going to lead you places you don't know. There's mystery. And everything that God's leading you, He hides it in mystery. And He unfolds it in order. He does it. He unfolds it progressively in order to win your heart to Him. He could just give you the whole blueprint right now. And He says, no, I'm going to cause you to realign with me day by day by day by giving you a little piece at a time. Because I've given, if I gave it all to you, you would get your peace from the information instead of your peace from your relationship with me. We want to have peace through information, and God wants us to have peace and strength through relationship with Him. So He he holds the information back. And we come to Him to get the information, and we end up interacting with His heart, and we have intimacy with Him. Of course, we all say we're different. Lord, give me the ten-year plan, and I promise you, I will really interact with you as intense. God says, well, let's not do it that way. I'll just give you little fragments You'll constantly run into little speed bumps to slow you down. You'll constantly run into hindrances and walls that cause pain. And they'll bring you to me every time. And you'll end up with intimacy and in the right place at the right time. How's that? Well, no, Lord. You just give me the map and I'll be there at the right place at the right time. The Lord says, no. You'll be there at the right place at the right time. But the pain of not knowing will cause you to interact with me. You'll actually have intimacy and be at the right place at the right time. I've told the Lord so many times, Lord, I tell you, I will be there. Just give me the map. Trust me. I'm not like those other guys. Just trust me. He says, no. Now listen to what he's going to do. If he he sends you to the uttermost parts, the uncharted regions, the unknown areas that are frightening. I mean, I tell you, the uttermost parts of the sea was a frightening concept to them back in those days. God says, I will be there, number one, to lead you, and number two, to hold you. I will be there. I will hold you in the scary places. My embrace will be there and my guidance and power will be there. I will lead you and I will hold you when you go to the scary places that I send you. And it doesn't necessarily mean just a geographic. It just means that place in life where you go, I don't want to get out of the boat. I want to stay in the boat. And the Lord says, get out on the water. That's what I'm talking about. It could be to, it could be to another job. It doesn't have to be some place that's, you know, some jungle somewhere. He will hold you. Isn't that something? The active energy of God's love and power and wisdom. The active manifest energy of His love. In coming to David, he says, Oh, I know this. Verse 14, I know it very well, David says. Now, one of my favorite stories is taken from verse 9. The story of a man that his mother was a praying woman. And he was a sailor. He was in the, he was in the uh, uh, Navy in World War II. And she prayed for a night and day, and when he left to go to war, she gave him a Bible. The guy says, well, Mom, I don't, well, okay, I'll take it. And put his Bible in his room and never went down to his quarters to look at it, and she prayed for him. She, she has the testimony that she was a, an interceding mom. Praise God for the interceding moms and dads. Just intercede, interceders. <laughs> and uh, make up my own words. <clears throat> But uh, then uh, they, they found themselves in a very difficult conflict. And whether it was the Japanese or the Germans, I'm not sure, but they were caught in a naval conflict in World War II and bombs were coming from everywhere and a couple of the major ships were going down. I mean, it, they were outnumbered 10 to 1 or whatever 
I can't remember the odds, but it was insurmountable odds. Everything, all of them were going down. You know, 500, 1,000 men sinking in a ship. And his, his ship was being bombed, and he's absolutely terrified of death. He runs into his little room, and he opens his Bible, and he puts his finger, and he cries out to God. And he opens his Bible, Psalm 139, he says, Oh God, if I take the wings of the morning, the wings of the dawn, is what it says in the King James, and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, there you will lead me, you will uphold me. And he said, If you will save me, I will serve you all the days of my life. And this naval retreat, kind of like Saul or something, you know, the Philistines are attacked. For some reason they retreated, and that was the only ship that was spared. And this whole and the name of the ship was called the Wings of the Dawn. That was the actual name of the ship. And he opened the scripture and it says, If I take the wings of the dawn in the remotest parts of the sea. And he gave his life to the Lord and he went on and had a was a very, very dedicated man of God. It's one of my favorite stories. I take the wings of the dawn. He says, that's me. That's the right verse at the right time. Thank you. God was holding that man and leading him. And obviously, uh, I mean, it obviously changed his life. Verse 11. Here's an interesting, verse 11 and 12 is interesting. It's talking to the fallacies, the false thinking of the unbeliever who thinks that darkness is a place they can hide. They hide from one another in darkness, but they then move it over and think they can hide in iniquity from God because it's, there's natural darkness. If I shall say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Now that's the darkness of negative, darkness falling on David. He says, I, I know that even God, your light will be around me. But the darkness shall not hide from you. But the night, listen, this, shines as the day. The dark, darkness and light are both alike to God. God, because he, ha, he doesn't operate, His perception is not based on needing natural light. God looks at nighttime and it shines like the day to God. It is the bright noon day in the darkest night when He looks at planet Earth as a totally light to Him. Because He operates on different principles. And the ungodly think because they're hiding under the cover of night, it gets away with it. And God says, you don't understand. It's totally light to me. But the way that David applies it is that even in the night when he's running cave to cave, he says, God, it's perfect daylight to you. You see everything right now. You're not at all hindered. Nothing is veiled from your sight. It's foolish for the unbeliever to seek to hide at night. And it's just unnecessary for the believer to feel abandoned because it's nighttime. God says the nighttime shines like the noonday sun to me. Look at verse 13 to 18. God's omnipotence, His full power. Now we're working on His creation here. You formed my inward parts. The inward parts here is the Hebrew word. It's translated in some versions, the kidneys or the, the seat of desire. He's talking about the emotion, the seat of desire and longing. He's talking about the emotional makeup. God formed your emotional makeup. I don't mean that He caused you to walk in all the paths that caused it to be more complicated in a negative way, but God gave us strengths and deficiencies in our emotional makeup. There's no human being besides the Son of God Himself that has the fullness of all the range of human emotions and wholeness, we all have a little bit of the full pick, uh, the, the full uh, uh, package, so to speak. We have deficiencies and we have strengths in our personalities emotionally. Our longings are set by God. The righteous longings, according to the callings and the plans, He formed us. You don't have to try to have my calling, and I don't try to have, need to have your calling. We all have longings that are handpicked by God. And God plans to give us a path according to those longings. He says, you formed my inward parts. That's talking about the emotional. You covered me in my mother's womb. Or it says in the margin, you wove me. There's a number of them, but that's, one, that's a, a favorite and it's a good one. But here's what David's saying. My most hidden part, my emotions, and my most hidden time when I'm in my mother's womb, 
the hidden part of my life, the way I feel the deep resources of my emotions that I can never see. You know, you, you can't ever fully discover them. And the most hidden time of your life in your mother's womb, both of them, God fully knows and has ordained them. God specializes in the hidden places of life. He specializes in the dark, in the hidden places that men can't see. Then He breaks out in verse 6 and verse 14. You just want to really... Verse 6, 14, and 17, actually. You just really want to put those together. Verse 6, verse 14, and 17. Those are the worship dimensions. I praise you. I'm fearfully made. I'm wonderfully made. Marvelous. Oh, marvelous is this whole thing. Marvelous. My heart is full of marvel is what he's saying. David was marveling. He was... The, he was wonder-filled, wonderment, and marvel touched him when he considered these things. He's fearfully and wonderfully made. That's a phrase that we hear, but I don't know if we've really thought much about it. You know, David's day, a thousand years B.C., they didn't really have any sophisticated anatomy studies. Now, in just, you know, general ninth grade, tenth grade class, you can study anatomy. Or, you know, the, the, uh, the human, the intricacies of the human body, the delicacy, the fragileness of the human body. The fact that we are eternal, one dimension of our being, and we're very, very temporal, and our bodies will go to the dust in a moment of time. The fact that we're exalted in the embrace of God, but we can sin and just do stupid stuff in, all the time. The combination of the glory and the weakness of the human frame, time and eternity. David said, I'm overwhelmed by this. He goes, what is going on anyway? And then David looks at his body, and he didn't really understand all the dimensions, but I tell you, just the simplest overview of anatomy, the human body is stunning. It's as stunning that the thousand worlds inside of the human body is as stunning as the thousand worlds up in the sky. There's a worlds and world, many, many worlds of knowledge and science in both arenas. And then God's unfolding of history is a whole other world of thought. And David beholds his creation externally, creation of the human, his own human uh, makeup, then God's guidance of history, God's achieving of redemption. These were arenas of thought that just absolutely thrilled David. And David says it here in verse 14. This is the, ver the strength. He goes, and these things my soul knows very well because I've given myself to meditate. We want to worship like David. We need to know some of the things David knew. When David says, this is something I know very well, beloved, this is like a major neon sign. Heart of David developed here, 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 here. Wonderful, fearful, marvel, awe. These are things you need to live like David. Wonderful, fearful, amazement. These are thoughts that if they enter your heart, you will feel more like David felt. Now he goes on in verse 15, he says, My frame, I was talking about the bones. It's not hidden from you when I was made in secret. So verse 15, his physical frame was not hidden from God when God made him, skillfully wrought him in the lowest parts of the earth. And they talk about, the commentators talk about that as a poetic of his mother's womb, from, made from the dust. Just a poetic statement. So in verse 15, he goes, My physical frame. My physical frame and my physical appearance and my physical abilities. My frame. The way you look and your physical abilities. God determined them, verse 15. Verse 13, your emotional makeup. God determined them. Verse 16, the path, the days that He has ordained for you. The days, the life plan for you. Your physical strengths and appearance. Your emotional makeup. Verse 13 and 15, and verse 16, your life plan, they're already written in God's book. They're all laid out there. Now, one of the great problems in the body of Christ and the whole world is people despise the way they look. Most people, they, there have been surveys done. Well, I read one survey where they went to these highly successful people, and 95% of them detested the way that they looked. Most human beings do not approve of the way they look. So it's just the fact of life across the whole earth. And then, then the image is put forth of what you're supposed to look like, and the people using the image hate the way they look. And they think, boy, I wish I looked like I did in that picture, you know. The point is this. There is a revelation when our heart connects with the fact your physical abilities and deformities 
what you have and what you lack, emotionally and physically. I'm not talking about related to, to, uh, to sin, meaning we, we go on a, a path of perversion and our souls are weakened. But the way that we've come forth, God says, I've strategically ordained them to build the image of Christ in you. And I believe there are some things that we can change and the Lord permits us to change them. But God wants us to reconcile. Verse 13, our emotional makeup, our emotional passions and longings. Verse 15, our physical frame, our our looks, appearance, and and defects. God has orchestrated them to... and, And verse 16... The path that He's called us to. Everybody wants somebody else's calling, somebody else's lifestyle, somebody else's journey. And God says to David, reconcile these things. I am leading you, David. It's me leading you. These are things that cause you to grow in me. These are weaknesses and strengths that have a combination of producing love in your heart when you meet me in every one of these three arenas. Your emotional uh, capacities, good and bad, your physical, good and bad, and your life path, your calling, and the way that God leads you, good and bad. He says, reconcile with those three things. They produce love in your heart if you can find me in those three arenas. David says in verse 16, your, your eyes saw my substance while I was being formed, and in your book, talks about a book, everything was written all of my days. The days fashioned for me when there wasn't even any of them done yet, they were already written in the book. God's, your days are already written in the book. I've used this analogy before and from, from this passage several times over the years here, but it's like if, you know, if I talk to an angel that's been assigned to minister to me. <laughs> He's really got a lot of work. He sits down and he appeared to me and had the great book. And he said, Mike, let me show you. He shows this is when you were six years old. It was all written. I go, oh, yeah, I remember that. was really, oh, yeah, that was cool. He goes, look, at it eight. That's what happened from there. I go, yeah, that, I never saw the connection. That really does connect. He goes, here's when you're 15 and you first met me. This is when, you're, when you got into the crisis when you were 18 and you said, oh, God, this will never work. And the three things. And look, every one of them worked out. Here, you're 22, you're 24, you're 26. Look, look how they are. Oh, yeah. And he goes, and this is the thing you prayed for when you were 30. And here you're 32. That's all written down there. He goes, and here you are now today. And here's your prayers. And he goes, oh, I can't show you the rest of the book. But it's already written. As surely as yesterday was written, tomorrow is written too. And as surely as God met you and He held you and led you, He will do it. It's already here. I can't show you. I'd love to show you. But the Lord says it will cause you to align with Him in a more intense way if I don't show you. But it's already written in the book here. All your days are already written down there. Let's say, oh, come on. Just give me a little peek. He goes, no, I can't do it. That's a made-up story, by the way. Why some of you look at me and go, what happened then? No, no, it's just a made-up story. <laughs> the book, verse 17. David breaks out again. Verse 6, verse 14, verse 17 are the real crescendos of praise. How precious. Oh, how precious your thoughts are to me. He says, how great is the sum of them. If I could count them, they would be more in number than the sand of the sea. Then I, when I awake, I am still with you. David's talking about, he says, it's, it's so numerous. If you could take, this is literal, this is, not, this is not just poetic. If you took all the seas of the earth, all the beaches, and counted every grain of sand, it would not outnumber the thoughts God has about every thought you have had, everything you have done, time and eternity. God's thoughts towards you individually are literally more numerous than every single grain of sand on planet earth. The fact that a king so exalted thinks about you so much. One of the great doctrines of life that David knew so well, that God thinks on him infinitely. God thinks on us in love. He's thinking on ways. He's thinking on how He pardoned us. How He's going to bring us into His beauty. How He's going to train us. He's thinking about our calling in eternity. Did you know you have a calling in eternity that God has already established? God's thoughts about you. You can't get the rich and the famous to give any time to the lowly. King of all the ages is consumed with thoughts about you. You're not the one. You didn't talk him into it. He had thoughts about you before you cared about him. David says, how precious. He goes, you think about me all the time. He says, this is unbelievable. You know, when 
Somebody remembers your birthday or a special day in your life and they acknowledge it. And they, in that sense, by acknowledging a special day, they celebrate that event in your life. There's another time when you're going through the most difficult time and somebody with sympathy understands and they, you feel heard and understood. God says, I celebrate and I have the, the, the pain and the understanding of your pain. I have understanding of your pain. I have all the arenas of your life. I understand them all and I'm with you in them. David's heart was romanced by this. Verse 23 and 24, he says, Search me, God. Try my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. What he is saying is this, very, very important. We're ending with this. David didn't trust his own searchings. David says, God, there's such a maze and mix of emotions, emotives, high and low. I don't, can't tell. Here's what God says. Here's what you do, David. You look at me, David. You stare at me. You say, behold God. Verse 8 and verse 4. And then I will impress the issue I care about you changing in you. There's a hundred issues that need changed. I'll change them one or two at a time. You look at me and I will shout at you when I want an issue changed. You know, a lot of people get lost in the endless maze of introspection and they're paralyzed. They, you know, the uh, paralysis by analysis. They're so, I don't know if it's good, bad. I don't know if I should or should have it. And they're completely paralyzed. Paralysis by analysis. They can't move forward. They can't move back. God says, you look at me. God, David says, I'll look at you and you search me and you shout when something's out of order. And Lord, here's the deal. If you don't shout at me, I'll be in your word. And I'll be in your word night and day with adoration. If you don't shout at me, I'm not going to think about it. And the Lord says, deal. You stay in my word though. And you look at me. Some people will hear this and say they, they, they never open their Bible. And they'll say, well, if God's not shouting at me, no, no, we fill our heart with the Word. We put our heart in front of the fire. I don't check out all my sins. I, I look at God to worship, and He shouts at me. I mean, they become very, very clear. I mean, your conscience burns like fire. They're, I don't do the internal uh, diagnosis. I never, I don't measure how far I am. I never try to figure out if I'm further this year than last year. I have no grid for that. I don't know if I'm further than you or them or him. I don't care. That's not even my business. My business is not to measure. Because, again, if you measure and you do good, you're proud. If you measure and you do bad, then you're condemned. You can't win measuring. I try to look at him, and I say, you search me. This is one of the verses I had on my prayer list when I was 18 years old. I, I, I was taught this in a Bible study. Somebody taught it. I said, I'll go with it. I'll look at you, and then you search me. I'll stare at you at your word. I'll worship you and I'll read your word and give my heart to you. And then you shout at me when something's out of line. And I have found it, not, I don't want to exaggerate it, but it's, I'll say this, it's clearly the most uncluttered, uncomplicated way to walk with God. That other way is just endlessly impossible to sort it out. Now, I don't know how good a job the Lord has, well, never mind. But anyway, verse 24. If there's any wicked way in me, God, you, you, you lead me. You shout at me. You lead me in the way of righteousness. You lead me in your way. Amen. Let's stand. Obviously, Psalm 139 is a lot bigger than what we just covered. Oh, beloved, I, I'm jealous that you could say wonderful. You could say, how wonderful. I'm jealous that you could say, oh, how precious your thoughts. I'm jealous that you could say, how marvelous. Oh, there's marvel in my heart over this. I am jealous that you could say, Oh, these things my soul knows very well. Oh, beloved, we want to worship like David. The beauty of God's mind. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.mikebickle.com. FOTB.com. Thank you.